Hello, hi, hi, Paco. Good evening. Mahalo for joining. We're just going to start with some music. Um, I want to introduce my husband, Justin Avellino. He's actually on the Big Island while we're I'm on Moloka'i. And just he's just going to start us off with a few songs. <laughs> Kamakana, who's a musician, also from Moloka'i. He lives on Oahu now. And I have to cheat and use words. I've got to learn that song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Silent show, reminisce that sweet embrace of. 
shine. I miss your smiles and lullabies in the evening time. Countryside, sorry. No. Been so long since I've been home. I miss the morning sunrise in the countryside. Gone so far to find my way. This time I think I'll stay within I song actually right now for us because my husband's been on the big island for about over a week <laughs> so he probably does miss home i hope he does miss home, <laughs> like but, home. Mahalo. thank you just for the music yeah. um and without further ado and mahalo all of you again for joining us this evening for our hawaii farmers union united speaker series and it's actually our turn on Moloka'i or Moloka'i chapter to um, host you folks this evening. And we're very blessed and fortunate to have someone who I call my mentor, my go-to all the time, um, blow up Uncle Glenn's phone, text, uh, whenever I have questions about water, homestead, seeding, anything, farming, whatever. It's always, my go-to is Uncle Glenn and um, mahalo uncle for always being responsive not just to me, but and not just to our island, but to our state and also beyond. I know you have been um, doing a lot even beyond Hawaii. So I'm so uh, honored that Uncle spent time with us this evening. Uncle Glenn Tevis, if you guys um, aren't familiar, but I think you should be. <laughs> um, he's a Hole um, Hawaiian homesteader. And he also worked for CTAR, um, the College of Tropical Ag and Human Resources for just over 40 years. And every year he wants to retire and he keeps getting sucked in and he has to stay longer because <laughs> we keep bugging him and hoping he doesn't retire. But even though um, you know, Uncle deserves to be able to um, you know, just relax with his ohana, do what he needs to do, but yet, we know that we can still call on him even in retirement. So mahalo nui, uncle. Um, hopefully it's not for another at least five more years. I don't know if we can replace you that easily. <laughs> so, um, but mahalo for joining us this evening and mahalo uncle Glenn for being our um, farmer speaker tonight. I'm going to share my screen. Mahalo Kilia and also mahalo to Justin for that music to really set the tone, you know, the beautiful prelude to our presentation. So um, I've been involved in seed for a while. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but um, this is a title we've been using a lot, local seeds for local needs. And, you know, what, what does this mean, you know, and why are we different from any, anywhere else in the world? And the answer is because we are. Um, my name is Glenn Tevis. I'm a county extension agent on the island of Molokai. I've been with the UH College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources on the island for 41 years now. Uh, next. Um, I'm also um, 
a uh, homestead farmer and with my wife, we've been farming for about 34 years. We grow all kinds of different crops. Um, we, and my son helps us, Iwani helps us as well. Uh, we grow fruits, vegetables, herbs, and also vegetable and flower seeds. Uh, next. And here's my wife outstanding in her field. Um, we, we grow a lot of taro, but we also, uh, we were into banana production for about 30 years, 32 years, uh, until the bunchy top finally caught up with us. So now we're shifting to a bunch of different things. Next. So I always try to start off uh, my presentations with a, uh, with a thought for the day. And this one is uh, definitely something we need to think about. You know, don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. And if you don't have seeds, you cannot plant. And this is what happened during COVID. Uh, we didn't have access to seeds. The farmers were scrambling all over. And I'll talk a little bit more about that next. I just had a few announcements. One is that uh, starting in January, we'll have a five-part seed series entitled Local Seeds for Local Needs. Uh, we'll be meeting the first Thursday of each month. In addition, we'll have a, um, a Zoom check-in on the third Thursday of each month to assist um, those on our project. Uh, you may be expected to grow a crop right at the get-go um, and you will learn all aspects of growing seeds in Hawaii. Um, this, is a, uh, this series is a collaboration between UH CTAR and Sustainable Molokai with funding from the Ceres Trust. And I applaud the efforts of Ceres Trust in supporting many projects in Hawaii, in including <coughs> Um, establishing our, um, maintaining our Hawaiian taro collection on Molokai, seed saving projects, and also um, statewide ulu distribution, which they got involved in. And we must have gave out about 700, 800 uh, ulu trees on the island. Um, next. The other thing I really want everyone to check out is this uh, video on YouTube called Check uh, Ketchup and M&Ms. And it was about um, how close we came to running out of food in Hawaii. And it was through the efforts of key individuals and volunteers who pulled this off. Somebody who's in charge was asleep, was asleep at the wheel. And we we're fortunate to have these individuals grabbing the reins and moving forward. And there were thousands of volunteers involved. Okay, next. So some background on the seed saving initiative in Hawaii. Um, I started saving seeds, seriously saving seeds about 12 years ago, working with the Hawaii Public Seed Initiative through Kohala Center. Um, this started with a two-day workshop actually uh, coordinated by Nancy Redfeather who was working for uh, Kohala Center at that time. And we had a two-day workshop in Kona and the A team from the Organic Seed Alliance in Port Angeles, Washington came down, uh, including Michaela Kali, Frank Morton, Matt Dillon, and John Navazio, um, expert organic seed breeders and seed producers. Uh, John Navazio is now with uh, Johnny Seed doing breeding over there. Uh, Matt Dillon works with a candy company that uh, supports a lot of projects. Um, and Frank Morton is a um, seed grower, um, wild garden seeds, uh, really nice collection of seeds that he sells. Next. Uh, an outgrowth of this effort is the formation of the Hawaii Seed Growers Network, um, an, an internet market for varieties grown in Hawaii. We have growers on most of the major islands and we're always looking for more growers. We're also interested in training new seed growers because food security and food sec uh, sovereignty starts with seed security. And also a shout out to my fellow seed grower on Maui, Evan Ryan of Ponokon Farm in Haiku. Um, He's, he's kind of leading the charge on Maui. Okay, next. So these are some of the growing challenges we have in Hawaii, which is different from any place in the world. We have a wide variation in weather, hot and cold, wet and dry, sunny and overcast, sometimes all at one time. Um, and so our, our plants need to be able to so, uh, have, have the ability to survive and thrive in tropical conditions including hot days and warm nights. And this is really important because most varieties of crops developed in the, the temperate areas, such as United States and also Europe, they cannot handle that warm night. 
And basically what happens is in, in colder climates, the nights are cold, the plants are able to rest, kind of build up their carbohydrates and their energy for the next day. But in Hawaii, the warm nights and they're just, they go into cardiac arrest. They cannot rest and um, a lot of them crash. And so we have to develop varieties for our tropical conditions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, our crops need to be able to handle the pests and diseases um, because they cost too much to control them. And because of our year round uh, production, we have pests all the time. Uh, in fact, when I was putting this presentation together today, I had some fruit flies on my screen. I was able to determine, oh, okay, we have another fruit fly out there today. This one was the melon fly. Usually the oriental fruit fly is the main one around that attacks all the fruits. But the, the melon fly attacks all the cucumber family. So the squashes, cucumbers, and watermelons and stuff like that. So that guy's around, around town. Okay, next. Okay, this is a really interesting quote. I think is really important. Why do we save seeds? These resources stand between us and catastrophic starvation on a scale we cannot imagine. In a real sense, the future of the human race rides on these materials. The line between abundance and disaster is becoming thinner and thinner, and the public is unaware and unconcerned. Okay, this quote is not recent. This is a quote way before COVID came. And it's like, okay, this guy knew COVID was going to come or, you know, he knew that we we're going to run into problems because there was a major shortage of vegetable seeds. We didn't have any seeds that we could get. Luckily, we have two refrigerators full of seeds in our office. So we were able to share it with um, the community. Next. Um, yeah. Okay, so why, why save seeds? Seeds are the spark of the farm. If you don't have seeds, you cannot plant. And if you cannot plant, you cannot harvest. Clear and simple as that. Um, so, you know, we, we try to get the best seeds. We're looking all over the world for them. We have seeds from Taiwan, from China, from um, Japan, also from the Philippines. The tropical areas, um, the seeds are better adapted to Hawaii than the ones out of Europe and United States. Next. So these are some of the reasons why we save seeds and I'll go into each one of them next. So food security, you know, the important part about food security is having seeds available at all times as insurance against the unexpected. And COVID came and a lot of farmers didn't have seeds and they couldn't plant. And then we ended up with shortages, food shortages all over the world. Um, Catastrophes in other parts of the world can affect the availability of food and seed on your farm. Um, we have monsoons in Southeast Asia that wipe out the, um, the Asian mustard crops. And it's a kind of a common thing. So, you know, like the pak choy, wong bok, choy sum, you know, kailan and pak um, kai choy. You know, we, we, um, we have shortages sometimes in the year or even some years. Um, catastrophes in Hawaii can cut Maui Nui off from Oahu. Um, and Hurricane Eva and Iniki are just examples of what can happen in Hawaii. Um, after Hurricane Eva, the state um, contracted a study to look at how much food was on Hawaii. And at that time, they estimated there was about 21 days worth of food. What happened since then, okay? Now we have seven days worth of food and two factors were involved in this. One was the high cost of uh, warehousing and two, the big boxes came to town. So the Costco's and the Sam Club, Sam's Club, and they don't store food in Hawaii. Their food is being stored somewhere between the West Coast and Hawaii on container ships, which is why we have seven days worth of food. So it's called just-in-time marketing. They don't store anything here. Just bring it in and sell it and move it out. And that makes us very vulnerable to um, shortages. Okay. Um, and yeah, we got seven days worth of food. We import 90% of our food. And um, we, can be, we can be considered a cargo cult waiting for the next container ship to arrive. 
Next. So this is Molokai. Uh, this is from the market right up the road. Sorry, no produce. Our produce came in frozen. So that the produce froze in the um, 40 foot container coming from Oahu to Molokai. Um, and this is our lifeline right here. That's the wharf on the bottom and the, um, the barge heading out. Um, what's interesting is that um, this is dangerous. Um, we have about 11 barge cancellations a year. So about almost one every month. And what that means is that you're gonna go in the store and you might not have milk, you might not have eggs and you might not have diapers and, and it gets real serious. About four years ago, the barge was hauling, uh, the tug was hauling the barge um, in the Kaivi channel, which is the channel between Oahu and Molokai, and the, take, the cable disconnected. And they were trying to figure out, okay, how are we gonna hook up this cable back to the barge? So, I mean, these are linked to the outside world is very uh, fragile, and we need to really consider what we're gonna do about it. Next. So we have unseasonable weather. This is August 4th, some of the driest times of the year. I think we call this the dog days of summer, but the dogs would be dog paddling right now uh, with the rain. And in fact, what happened was I called, um, weather, I emailed the weather service in Honolulu, Kevin Kodama. And I said, what, what's happening with the weather? And he goes, why? I said, it's pouring cats and dogs on Molokai. He goes, no way. I sent him this picture and he goes, wow. I mean, even the weather service didn't know. So yeah, we have been a very localized weather where some areas are flooded and other areas are just bone dry. Next. So seed security is food security. Without seeds, you're not gonna be secure with your food. Okay, next. So going back to why save seeds, having adapted seeds are really important. And I kind of talked a little bit about that already, but having varieties adapted to your climate and seasons can increase success and productivity in your garden. Um, you can select varieties or you can develop varieties um, to address issues found on your island. Heat tolerance is really important as the temperatures rise, you need to have varieties that can handle the heat. Um, disease resistance, resilience means being able to bounce back after a storm and having hot weather and then rainy weather and then hot weather again, um, and this tropical weather and just changing weather conditions. Um, varieties can be selected for certain seasons. I get involved a little bit with that. Um, and I think that's, that's really important that um, we develop new varieties for Hawaii. That's, and and it, it's gonna take the community to be involved. We had a project last year where we had um, 39 people statewide growing different varieties of vegetables. Uh, we we uh, had a cross and they grew it and a, a tomato came out all different colors and they're able to select the variety for their specific location. And we had people from all over the state involved. Um, this is called citizen science and they um, learn how to develop um, varieties. Um, next. So we need, we need seeds adapted to our unique climatic conditions. This is a variety called Sierra, a heat tolerant lettuce, very heat tolerant. And there's a lot of varieties being developed off of this variety. Um, the problem I had with this variety is I had a hard time getting them to bolt. It's so heat tolerant, it didn't bolt. So I had a hard time making seeds of this guy. I mean, that's how heat tolerant it was. Um, and so most varieties are not are developed in temperate, areas and what are their priorities? Two things are the main priorities for some of these areas such as Europe and uh, the United States. One is earliness because the snow is coming and the other one is cold tolerance because the snow is coming. These are not important to us. We're moving in a totally different direction. So we need to develop varieties for ourselves, okay? Um, so for me, I mean, I want a, I want a late maturing plant that develops a strong root system and a solid frame before they flower so they can hold a heavy load over a longer period of time, okay? And so that's the kind of direction that we need to be going in, which is totally different from any other place. Next. 
So these are two diseases on Maui. We don't have these two diseases on Molokai, but we need to plan for it because it's, it's not a matter of um, if, but when they, they arrive here. So this is uh, tomato spotted wilt virus and to tomato yellow leaf curl virus. Um, the spotted wilt has been on Maui for a long time. There's an, another strain, but in the 1990s, uh, Maui was the main producer of tomatoes and lettuce. Unfortunately, both of those crops were uh, susceptible to spotted wilt. And so it would hit the um, lettuce, then it would hit the tomato. And so they just stopped in the 90s, they just stopped planting lettuce and tomatoes in the scale that they had. Uh, leaf grow actually came in from Israel, made its way up, uh, up to Europe, across the United States, and it found its way in Hawaii about 2008. So um, these pictures are from a trial on Maui. We, we um, grew out varieties that were developed for resistance to these two diseases. And we had a bunch of them that looked really nice. Next. So part of it is having, um, developing your own variety. So this is a um, lettuce, uh, lettuce production, seed production that I um, did this, uh, this past year. Uh, looking at heat tolerance, looking at um, other aspects of varieties, and uh, all of these have been screened before, so they're like these are like the, the top ones. Um, and I'm making I'm making seed. I'm actually processing seed right now. Okay, next. So seed availability, and I wrote, already touched upon on this um, big problem during COVID. Uh, I think we're still going to have problems off and on. Um, so we're losing hundreds of varieties to seed companies who market a few varieties for economic reasons while moving others from the marketplace. They're narrowing the gene pool and they're possibly jeopardizing future food, food production, but it's all about economics. And um, once you lose a variety, it may be lost forever. And you want to be able to have seed when you need it. If not, you may miss a season or a market opportunity and seeds are getting expensive. Next. So this is um, from the Johnny Seed Catalog. So this one tomato is 50 seeds for $64. So actually more than a dollar per seed. Um, and this seems to be a trend, especially with um, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants seem to be leading the charge. Um, and I think the lettuces are probably gonna be right behind. So we need to, Really, if, if we grow your own seed, I mean, I can grow an ounce of lettuce seed and it's like 2,500 seeds, more than I can possibly, you know, and just think what a pound of seed is. Next. Okay, so these are some of the seeds that I, I, um, I grow. This was actually shared at the Organic Seed Alliance um, seed exchange in uh, Corvallis, Oregon at Oregon State University. Um, and then everybody's bringing seeds from all over the United States, from Mexico, from Europe, and um, they want our seed and we want their seeds. And then we can test it out and see how they do in Hawaii. Next. So this is um, beet leaf chard, also called uh, mountain spinach. It, it, it's kind of a combination of a spinach and a chard. Most of the chards will not produce seed in Hawaii, and uh, including beets. Beets don't produce seed in Hawaii. And so the, the leaf chard would be like the, um, you have some of these striped varieties, you have these red varieties, bright light varieties, um, but they won't produce seed in Hawaii. Next. Okay, why save seeds? Seed sovereignty is something you hear a lot about along with food sovereignty the ability to control our food and not letting the large corporations control their food or control our food. Um, there was an interesting article in the national news the other day about some of these companies are actually gouging. They're charging much higher than the, um, they usually would. And so a lot of companies are trying to make their money back after losing it through COVID. So the, the prices are really elevated uh, on Molokai is just totally out of control and you really got to shop around. I mean, you can have the same product in two different stores. One of them is $2 cheaper than another. 
Um, so, and for organic growers, you may be buying ge um, genetically modified contaminated seed and that would jeopardize your organic certification. Next. Um, okay, let's see. Um, corn is a good example. I mean, a lot of the corn uh, inbred lines have been taken off the market and um, converted into genetically modified corn varieties and not accessible unless you're willing to pay the price for that seed. Otherwise, you could be saving these kinds of seeds yourself. If it's not if it's not genetically modified, next. Um, the this is a, a lettuce trial I had on the island. Um, it's interesting because I try to screen new varieties, but this is a cross that a friend of mine in Oregon made. I sent him some manure lettuce, and he crossed it with his variety uh, called Leopard, and this is manure Leopard. And they came out all different colors and different shapes and everything. Uh, the first year I grew it in the summer, we had really hot weather up in the 90s. I was able to select seven heat tolerant varieties. And then this one was in the winter time, uh, planted them around late November, early December. And they were doing really well until February when all hell broke loose and we had rain for a whole week. And this trial, we lo lost 75% of the plants. But then the remaining plants were more tolerant to rain and diseases that come in the winter time. So this is the kind of thing that you need to do. On the left is um, kale. This is um, Ethiopian kale, or we call them Coronata kale, that uh, you can collect the seeds from. These plants can get to about seven feet tall, and it's a great famine food to always have in your garden. Next. Um, and then this is where I collect the best of the varieties, make seeds, um, dry them all, process them, and, and clean out the seeds and separate them all. I do what is called winnowing, where um, after I strip the plants down, I'll hold it in the wind or I use a fan, and the fan will blow the rubbish away and the seeds will drop in a pan. Okay, next. Okay, the first thing about farming is you need to know your soil. So these pictures are from the Hawaii Soil Atlas. You can just Google Hawaii Soil Atlas and you can get it. And it tells you what soil you have. Uh, it's interactive. So you put a button where you live and it'll tell you what soil that is. Um, and so in Holy Hua, it's kind of, uh, I see the soil so much that I kind of know what soil is in what area. So up towards the, um, the high school, that's the Kalai series, highly weathered soil. Um, needing a lot of amendments. That's where you are, Kilia. Um, and then as we go down the road, like down Farrington, we, we bump into the Lahaina soil. Um, and the Lahaina soil runs all the way to Kolea Avenue where the Rollins homestead is. And then beyond that is the Molokai series that runs all the way to Momomi and then down to the Farrington Highway. <coughs> and the gulches have different soil. The gulches have what is called holy horse soil. So the gulches are rich because it's all washed down from the flatlands into the gulches. So it's kind of a alluvial soil. Um, rule of thumb, the drier the area, the richer the soil. <laughs> um, and in, in Holy Hua, the most commonly deficient nutrient is calcium, pretty much across the board. I, I've seen thousands of soil samples out of Holy Hua and calcium is your limiting factor. So you have a lot of different ways to address this. Um, if, if, um, if your pH is low, you need to have your pH between six and 6.5. If your pH is low, you can use ground coral to bring the pH up and also increase the calcium status. If your soil is low in magnesium, um, you can use dolomite that increases the pH, increases the calcium and also adds some, P, um, some magnesium to the soil. If your pH is good between six and 6.5, you can use gypsum that just increases your calcium. So that is kind of like our fast soil, soil class for the day. Okay, next. So Maui, Maui soil is a little more diverse from us. The island is bigger. Um, you have two mountains with different kinds of soils. Uh, you have more um, diverse elevation. And from this, you have more diverse climate. So 
again, the wetter the area, the more leached out the nutrients are, the drier the area, the, the richer the soil. What's interesting about this island is that Molokai has a lot of red soils, the, what we call the oxy soils, the Lahaina, Molokai series. Um, but uh, Maui has very little. If you look at the red, that's the red soil. So Lahaina and, um, and uh, let's just see, that's, um, I'm trying to think, that's Haiku, no, not Haiku, right? Paia, around Paia, that area uh, has that red soil. But Holy Hoa, that's one of the dominant soils on Molokai. Next. So this is really important, okay? The severity of most diseases can be reduced by proper nutrition. And that's why, I mean, you cannot fight diseases by spraying them. You have to make the plant strong so they can handle the diseases. I talked a little bit about that where we, get, we um, can grow late maturing varieties that create their frame, the large root system, they can sustain a lot of damage. Um, so this is probably one thing I learned from uh, a plant breeder at UH that I worked with um, that developed a lot of the varieties that are available today from UH. Next. And we also need to be practicing good management practices. So crop rotation, not planting the same crop over and over. And this is dip, very typical human nature. Oh, the taro grew really good over here. I'm gonna put another taro crop in the same place. That is a no-no. You wanna be able to um, move the crops around. You want a lot of different kinds of crops. So you're not having a buildup of pests and diseases. You wanna use cover cropping and green manure. Um, you want organic matter like I have here when I, I went and cut down all the guinea grass and use it to uh, cover the ground and to build up the soil. Um, the other is to have crop free periods. Uh, what happens is sometimes the insects cannot be controlled. They just too much. Right now I got um, pepper weevils all in the field. So they're attacking all of the different peppers, the chili peppers and, and the only way I'm gonna get rid of them is I have to stop growing peppers for a little while. And they'll, they'll leave, they'll, they won't have a food source, the pepper weevils will leave and they can start all over. The other important um, aspect, and we don't do enough of this, is the use of insectaries. And what this is, is planting flowers along the borders or even in the garden um, that produce nectars and pollen that feeds the good guys. Okay, so it feeds the predators and the paras parasitoids that will attack the bad guys in the garden. So that is really important. Um, on Molokai, we're fortunate to have sand. Uh, we can make biochar. We have seaweed or gorilla ogo that we can incorporate. What is really important is to do soil samples, at least one soil sample when you start. So you know what's low. You can focus on building that nutrient up. And next, almost found. Okay, so these are probably the two best books about seed, seed saving and seed growing. The Organic Seed Grower by John Navazio. I talked about John earlier. He was one of the A team that came to Hawaii and, and taught us how to grow seeds. He's a breeder. Um, he develops, he, he'll even refine old varieties and make them better just by screening them and finding um, the better ones out of the, out of the whole mix. Um, and the other one is Seed to Seed, Susan Ashworth. And the What's interesting about the seed to seed, uh, one person involved, a friend of mine was uh, Kent Wheely. Uh, Kent was the one who started Seed Savers in Decorah, Iowa, and that saved a lot of the heirlooms, went all over the world and collected. He, I remember he even went to the Ukraine to collect um, what they call black tomatoes, these dark tomatoes from the Ukraine, famous for, um, famous from that area, a very different kind of taste. Um, and so, yeah, he went all over the world. And because of his efforts, we still have some of these varieties to me. And next. And that is it. So, um, any questions, comments? Uncle, you was mentioning something about certain plants that don't produce seeds in Hawaii. Why is that? Um, a lot of these are um, what they call biennials. They need um, two years to produce seed and they need a cold climate. 
So oh. what what this is is like a good example would be like carrots. So what they do is they grow the carrots, the carrot matures, they dig the carrots out of the ground, they cut off the tops, they cut half of the carrot off, they store it in the refrigerator, they chill it for the winter, or if they have a cellar, they put them in the cellar. And then in the springtime, they pull it out and then they stick um, the, the uh, carrots in the ground and they flower and that's how they make seeds. Uh, but certain carrots can produce seed in Hawaii. Um, the oddball color ones, like the purples and the reds can produce seed in Hawaii. Um, I produced seed a couple of years ago, Cosmic Purple produced it. Um, I'm just planting uh, deep purple um, this week and see how that one goes. But uh, these plants are called biennials and they require two years to produce and they need, require so many hours at so many degrees, usually between 32 and 55 degrees. They need X amount of hours in order for them to flower and produce seed. And we don't have that kind of climate in Hawaii. Okay. Um, there was another question that came up. Um, okay, what is the best? Okay. Okay, that's a, that's a really good question. Okay, first of all, um, moisture is the killer of seeds. So you wanna be able to bring the moisture level down from the seed. So when you harvest, you try to dry it really well. Uh, if you can't bring it down, because if you just drain it in the house by the windowsill, which I do a lot, um, you're going to bring it down to about 60%, which is the average humidity in Hawaii, about 65. Um, so I use um, silica gel. Sometimes I dry them in a van. I try to, um, you know, I try to bring the, um, the moisture down. The, the lower the moisture on the seed, the lower the temperature you can store them in. So you can get them down close to freezing. Um, if, the, if the seeds are not dry enough and you freeze it, the water in the seed will break up, this, will um, damage the seed. So moisture is the killer of seeds. Bring the moisture level down, then you can store it. I store it in a refrigerator. I have it in a, um, either a bottle or a plastic bag because some refrigerators have high moisture, especially the types that are um, not self-defrosting. So they can build up um, moisture within the um, within the bags of seeds. Okay, uh, let's see. I, I know I had one more question over there. Um, okay, um, what is what is your favorite lettuce to grow from seed? Oh man, this is a hard one. Um, right now I have um, a cross that was developed by a friend of mine in Hilo, Russell Nagata. Uh, Russell used to be the uh, lettuce breeder at the University of Florida. And I send seeds to him and say, hey, cross this, cross that. But he developed this variety I call Hilo Green. It's a cross between Rex and, Rex is probably the most heat tolerant lettuce. A cross between Rex and Little Gem, which is a miniature romaine, crossed it to Manoa with the hope of um, selecting a variety that looks like Manoa, but can handle the heat. Manoa cannot handle the heat. We have a lot of tip burn problems with it. Um, so I'm, I'm working on that one right now. Uh, I just talked to Jamie Ronzello. Jamie grows lettuce on Molokai for the sustainable Molokai. She likes Sparks, which is a romaine from Johnny's. Um, uh, another one I think that's really good um, is a variety called Concept. Uh, it's, a, it's a romaine, but it has a soft leaf. Some of the romaines are real um, industrial <laughs> strength plants that are used to ship all over the world. Um, and so they're kind of a hard plant you want you want a soft, crunchy plant. Uh, so uh, concept, I think, is another one. And then Johnny's had, for the heat, Johnny ha Johnny's have, has a lot of, um, they call it summer crisp types. And that's what Sierra is. There's another one called Canasta. There's one called Nevada. There's a bunch of different ones. But what comes down to it is you want a lettuce that tastes good. Uh, Manoa has a really nice taste, and we're trying to develop that taste on other varieties. Um, another variety I showed over here that we're working on is called Manoa Leopard. Um, Frank Morton at Wild Garden Seeds has made, I think, 15, 20 selections from that cross. I mean, you can't believe. When I sent him a letter, uh, Manoa, I said, try this variety. He crossed it. He said, I can't believe this lettuce. And he already has about 15 to 20 selections out of that cross, like miniature heads, little Manoas, spotted Manoas, and all kinds of different ones. So. 
Those are some of them. Uh, you really got to look at where you are because there's some diseases in certain areas such as downy mildew. So if you have downy mildew, then you need to have downy mildew resistant varieties. Um, okay. When you are crossbreeding, what traits are you looking for? And are you trying to develop exotic heirloom seeds? Okay. Um, first of all, heirloom, we don't, there's no clear definition of heirlooms. Um, one person said, oh, seeds that are 50 years old. Um, so it's kind of a nebulous, uh, nebulous statement. Um, a friend of mine, Kent Wheely, was the one who coined that phrase, heirloom seeds. Um, but when crossbreeding, what, are, what traits are you looking for? This is a really good question. In our citizen science project, I laid out all the different things that they should be looking for. And so you need to be looking at each one of them. I mean, you've been looking at yield, you're looking at taste, you're looking at the ability to bounce back after a storm, you're looking at the ability of the plant to handle diseases. You might want a compact plant versus a sprawling plant. Um, and you kind of have to shoot for the center. I mean, you want, you know, what is the most important? You can have the best tasting plant, but if it hardly has any fruits on it, then it's not, it's not gonna work. So you, you're gonna have to balance your traits and what is most important. Disease resistance is critical in Hawaii. Without disease resistance, you can't grow a lot of different crops. So that, that becomes one of the more, for me, that's one of the most important ones. That's the one I look for all the time, okay. Any other questions? Any follow-ups? Okay, not seeing anything more from the chat or any hands raised. Oh, there's one more. Okay. How many years to get the perfect seed for yourself? Okay. Um, sometimes you luck out and you can do them in a few years. Um, most crops take about 10 years Others might take less. Um, a lot of crops, you want six generations to actually select and the, the plants will become more refined. They'll be more uh, uniform. But in Hawaii, if you have good weather, you might be able to do those six generations in three years or even less. So yeah, you wanna be able to get six generations on them. But sometimes the varieties are real uniform from the get-go. You know, you, you plant it out. Um, I had some um, squash, moshata squash, they, called, uh, they call it um, tropical pumpkins. Um, and a friend of mine in um, Virginia, he, uh, they were having a disease that was all up the Eastern seaboard on um, butternut squash. And I told him, hey, I got this variety out of Taiwan, you might wanna try it. So he plants it and he finds out, wow, this variety is resistant to this disease that they were dealing with. And that is um, downy mildew. And so he started crossing the, the Chinese pumpkin with his um, butternuts and he developed new varieties and they're starting to come out right now. So you want to be able to find disease resistance. Um, otherwise, you can't grow a crop. And we have some diseases in Hawaii that can get pretty bad. So yeah, that's, it really depends on the crop. And if, if you're just growing it for the garden, you don't really care if it's uniform. Um, I was growing this one lettuce I planted and they come out all different colors and then somebody said wow you got a whole bunch of different varieties and I didn't want to tell them that's all one variety so you know it depends what you're looking for you want you might want something that um has all different colors and it's one variety you just plant that one variety in the ground you got all these different color lettuces um, and I have this in the ground right now just I just transplanted them yesterday and uh, Mano Leopard, and they're all different colors. Some are red, some are green, some are spotted. Some have a lot of spots. Some only have a little bit of spots. So, yeah, it really depends. I think for gardeners, you don't have to have that perfect seed. You just, in fact, if you have a variety that all comes out on the same day, that's not beneficial in a garden setting. You want it to, you want to be able to harvest it like over a week or even over, over two weeks. Uh, you know, a few lettuce to eat every day. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, what is the average processing time for seeds? Oh, this is a, this is a really hard one. Um, I can harvest seeds today, depending on the weather or how I'm drying it. If I dry them down fast, if I use um, silica gel, 
I can I can dry them down in a couple of days, and then I need to process it. The problem I run into sometimes is I just put them on the side and I don't finish processing, and I got about three big containers of your seed that I need to process, but it doesn't take that long. The only thing is that growing seeds is different from growing uh, the crop. So in growing seeds, you need to take it beyond um, the crop harvest stage. So you need to make sure your seeds are mature when you harvest it. Okay. Anything else? Okay, right. so what we're gonna do, I, I'm gonna make a couple announcements and um, then we're gonna end off with my husband just um, singing a couple more songs, but I wanted to share screen to make this announcement first. Um, actually, I wanted to just say too, for a Moloka'i chapter, we make a year on December 17th. So we're coming up to our uh, one year and we hope to have you know a celebration right around that time we're still coordinating that for our uh, members and to welcome new members to our Molokai chapter and then we also i'm sure all of you know you've been getting um these emails from us um our hawaii farmers union united 2022 annual convention is being held on december 2nd through the 4th at Hawaii Taro Farm in Waikapu, Maui. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, if you haven't received these emails and you just so happen came on tonight because by word of mouth, leave your um, email in the chat and we can um, you know, try to get the, this information to you where you can register uh, for the event. There's all kinds of stuff. So I'm just gonna scroll down really quickly to show you the um agenda so friday december 2nd saturday december 3rd and then up till sunday okay so we awesome to see all of our farmers across the state you know coming together there on maui uh, mahalo to hawaii farmers union united our maui chapters for coordinating and mahalo nui Uncle Glenn again for sharing with us this evening and spending some time with us. Mahalo for your ike, your knowledge and um, everything else in your presentation. And we're just gonna end this evening with a um, couple more songs. Mahalo everyone for joining us. Yeah. 
everybody have a good have evening a